My name is Robert McCoy. I'm an architect, a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of California in Berkeley in 1963. Been licensed in California since about 1964. From about 1965 until about 1985, my, most of my experience has been in a high-rise, multi-story steel buildings. The first major high-rise building that I uh, was involved with was the headquarters for Pacific Gas and Electric Company in San Francisco. It's a 34-story building, about a million two hundred and fifty thousand square feet in the high-rise portion. About the same time that it, uh, that the World Trade Center was designed and built in New York. In fact, we we uh, corresponded with the Yamasaki's office at the time to discuss certain aspects of their building and ours. We, both buildings were designed, for instance, to resist the impact of an airplane uh, flying into them. Uh, while with, the, with that firm in San Francisco, Hertzka & Knowles, uh, I also uh, participated in the design of uh, 575 Market Street, a building for Standard Oil, one of their headquarters buildings. It was 44 stories. A 100 Pine Street, uh, which is 34 stories. And following pg and &E, I finished up the final design, redesign, and construction of the uh, St. Mary's Hospital and Medical Center in San Francisco. Following that stint, I was in private practice for a, a period when uh, William Pereira acquired my firm to give him a presence in San Francisco. He had a couple of high-rise buildings to do, uh, one of which was one Sansom, which was initially designed as a 54-story as a building, subsequently reduced to about 44 stories when uh, Citicorp came into the project. As those buildings were getting underway, uh, my, I was needed in Los Angeles and relocated to Southern California where uh, I was the project director and chief operating officer for the joint venture for the design and construction of the uh, Tom Bradley International Terminal at uh, Los Angeles International Airport. That building is about a million square feet. It, uh, it depends upon where you measure it, but it's a good solid five-story steel frame building. Uh, a given footprint on the departure level, for instance, is a, in excess of three football fields side by side. It's a pretty good size open air steel frame building. Uh, those buildings in New York are, have a very strong exterior skin. Uh, the columns are three foot four on center and they're about 14 inches wide. There's about a 42-inch spandrel at each floor of steel. So the net opening where the window is, by the time you discount the fireproofing and the rest of it, is, you know, 40 or 50 percent of the exterior skin. When those planes hit those buildings, they were shredded the moment they started into the building. Most of the fuel, most of the plane, uh, w was torn apart as it went through the outside skin. I've seen photographs since that show that it, um, the columns and some of the beams were severed and in the uh, North Tower, which was, I guess, uh, not surprising considering the force of the impact, the weight of the plane, and the, and, uh, and the, and the speed. Uh, but uh, the diagrams that I've seen shown that those planes were, in the, that everyone else has concluded the same thing I had. The planes were shredded. The fireball was on the outside. The impact, shredding the plane, will create enough heat to explode that, that fuel. And that fuel moving at 500, 550 miles an hour as it goes through, the, as whatever's left going through the building is, or on the outside is seeking oxygen to explode and burn. It was gone in moments after it hit the building. So in, in, in rethinking it, uh, I discovered that there were others who had had uh, similar thoughts and that's when I came across Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, impact on the two towers. On the North Tower, the plane from the, looks to me like it took out about 60 columns or so out of, or about, I read somewhere about 60% of the columns and some of the beams. But the building didn't deform and f collapse. The nature of the steel frame for that exterior skin, the supporting the exterior wall of, that, of those buildings, is a, a truss. It's a solid truss. You've got columns at three foot four on center, and you've got 42 inch deep or 48 inch deep spandrels, beams at 12 foot on center, and they're all welded together. They're 
put together in the in a in a group and erected in the building in tiers, uh, three floors high, several bays wide. The the buildings were solid. They lost columns, they lost beams, but the building didn't collapse. On the south tower, the building hit pretty well towards a corner and took out the columns in a, along one wall, and it began to cave in, and the building, as we saw in the videos, the top leaned over and began to twist, and then it, before it started down. Now, now we have the mass of that building from up above coming down in strong, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's going to begin to impact the whole building as it comes, as everyone has described. But it's going to come down in a pancake fashion, in a staccato kind of a way, bang, 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 bang as it comes. It's not going to come as a smooth fall. You're going to see puffs of, of uh, pulverizing concrete each time a floor hits a series of floors hits another floor. I didn't see that. I saw billowing clouds of, of dust when I, when I viewed the, uh, the videos. Now keep in mind that the steel supporting this building in the middle is very strong. Those columns were probably four times as strong as they needed to be to support the dead weight above them. So now you have this building coming down in a staccato pancaking effect, or that's what we're led to believe, and the columns below just simply not there, not resisting it, not stopping it, and they came all the way to the ground. Uh, from what I, what I understand, the buildings actually accelerated as they came down, meaning they were not getting resistance from these massive columns in the center of the core of this building. The core of this building was very heavy. True, it was a lot of holes, like mostly holes, mostly voids, but it had beams in all directions and it had columns on a fairly regular spacing, something on the order of magnitude of 33, 35 feet on center, some of them closer together than that. So it's accelerating as it's coming down. There's not meeting resistance from, from all of the columns, these massive columns inside the building. And when you get to the bottom of the building, they're huge columns, huge. Where were those columns? Why weren't they resisting the, the, and punching through the mass of the building coming down from above? Where were they? Let's go back, let's go back again to the top of the building. Remember I mentioned that, that the top began to buckle over and twist. If this building were truly severely damaged at the, at the floors where the plane went through, and, and uh, came down as an intact block above that, I would have expected that continuation, the twisting and the tipping to have continued. I really would have expected the top section to have continued to veer off in the uh, direction it was headed. It would have gone over the edge and started down top first. That didn't happen. So when we returned to building one, the first notice of failure appears to be the, the uh, television antenna on top coming down into the building. It's coming down in the middle of the building where the building is mostly holes for elevators and duct shafts and pipe shafts and that sort of thing. There's nothing in the middle of the building to burn. How did that steel soften enough to allow the television mast to uh, sink almost straight down into the building, and then the building began to collapse. Next, when we, when we, we talk about Building 7, our building wasn't hit by a plane. We're told that there were, there are, uh, there were uh, uh, fuel tanks to uh, run emergency generators. The fuel wasn't a contributing, according to the NIST study, wasn't a, a um, contributing factor to the, to the collapse. Their theory is office furnishings. Well, the photos don't seem to show that the building was burning in all over. It, the photos that I've seen seem to indicate that the building, that there were isolated fires scattered around the building and, and not the whole building burning. This would have us to believe that, that, that these were 
was a typical office fire, scattered office fires, if you will, that brought this building down, that burned for a period of six hours or so. Uh, a, a typical office furnishings uh, and isolated office furnishings would burn for 20, 30 minutes or so uh, and spread over time and burn out in one area, burn in, burn, begin to burn more in another area as the fire spread. In a building like this, uh, it would have, for it to have burned six hours, it would have had to burn through a, a, quite a number of floors. It would have been visible on the outside as the fire lit, leapt from floor to floor going up, uh, as it has been in other buildings, uh, uh, like First Interstate Tower and when it burned in Los Angeles. That doesn't seem to be the, uh, the case with the uh, Building 7. It, it appears in watching the videos that there were isolated fires on several floors, but they weren't leaping up the outside of the building. Once this building begins to, to break, and then it begins to, to fall uh, with the speed of gravity, acceleration of gravity. It's, the building is accelerating as it comes down. There's no resistance until the building gets down maybe halfway and, and finally is beginning to encounter maybe some of the, its own debris uh, lower, on in the, lower, lower down in the building. But it still comes to the ground in a, in a very short order. And when it's all finished, the outside walls from the lower floors are piled one on top of the other right in the middle of the building. You know, just like a house of cards if it were coming down. Uh, I, find, I find that a little hard to believe. If, if this building were to have collapsed due to fire, I would have expected it to behave much more like a fire in your fireplace. If you build a fire in your fireplace and you light it, uh, as it, as it burns uh, and, the, and the heat begins to build, uh, you'll get a localized failure here and then a localized failure there and the logs will shift a little and shift around. And, and over time, you'll, the, all of the logs will become fully engulfed in flame and you'll and fire and you'll get hot in the middle and they'll slowly burn themselves away until ultimately you get a total collapse. But the fire is fully engulfing and involving all of the wood that's left in the fireplace. Keep this in mind, that's wood burning in a fireplace or wood burning in a, in a wood frame building. It's not steel which doesn't burn, especially steel that is covered in fireproofing. There's no indication that I've seen that indicates the fireproofing was removed from Building 7. Further, uh, since the mid-60s, I've tried to follow high-rise fires because they're uh, something we worry a lot about as we design these buildings. And, and I'm not aware of any high-rise building that have come down as a result of fires. Even though we've had um, some of these fires uh, have been much hotter much longer lasting. I mean, the inter first interstate fire was very hot in Los Angeles. Uh, as, as a high-rise fire goes, I can't remember uh, even a partial collapse in any of these buildings that I've, that I've uh, watched over the years. Uh, high-rise buildings, uh, I, got, I started in San Francisco doing high-rise buildings because that was a special interest of mine. I, I paid close attention to them for the last 40, 45 years, and, uh, and uh, I think that's probably why I'm still uh, interested in what happened uh, at the World Trade Center. Something about the way those buildings came down doesn't add up in my mind. Uh, there was a lot of good work that I've seen in, in what few things I've seen in this, but when you, when you look at the whole, is when it begins to fall apart. How can those steel columns, the massive steel columns that they are, supporting that weight of that building, virtually disappear? Why aren't they poking up straight out of, the, out of that rubble at the bottom of the building? So what I'm looking for is, is a new investigation. There may be some well, let's, let's say, let's call it a new investigation, where, where all of the original uh, information and tests and hypotheses are re-examined, as well as the ones that have surfaced since, the new ones, including the, the allegations of uh, controlled demolition. Uh, there have been a lot of published tests and reports on, on the, uh, the possibility of, uh, of controlled demolition of these buildings. And I think they should be carefully considered. I mean, at this point, 
let's wait, let's take the time to do it right and get it right and get the record right. I signed the, the petition for architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth uh, because I felt it was an organization trying to get it at the truth of what in fact actually happened, what brought those buildings down. I didn't feel in looking at it and reading the information from the organization that it was a, a, cons a conspiracy theory of uh, abdicating any conspiracy theory of any nature. I don't want to be involved in conspiracy theories. I, you know, uh, there are lots of them that can go on. We can speculate on that forever. What we really need to know is how, how those buildings came down.